a kia ora nā mīna hā kia koutou, tō tahi nā mihi ki te rungarawa, a nā nā nei nā mihi katoa. Uh, in nā mate ko wea ki te pō haide, haide a haere atura, a te hongo mate, ki te hongo mate, ki hongo ora ki te hongo ora tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. A kia ora everybody, thanks for turning up, don't worry about the children out the front, ignore them. Um, I just would really like to welcome the minister and his team here today, um, and welcome him to the stage to bless us with a few words. Hi folks in the West Coast, greetings. Thank you very much for turning out. Quite apart from your nieces and nephews and third cousins from Christchurch who have come to try and uh, compromise our day. But I come with the authority of my ministerial colleagues to an area that reflects the legacy of a proud New Zealand industry, otherwise known as the minerals mining industry, an industry that for far too long has been marginalised, stigmatised, and the men and women in that industry have been demonised. Well, today, in Blackpool, this is a red letter day. We are turning around that falsehood and that attack against our industry, and I need your support to do it. <laughs> Obviously, when I give this speech, I invoke the memories of the families who ploughed their lives, gave their sweat to put this industry on the map in this part of New Zealand. I'm joined today by my colleague from the ACT Party, Simon Thorpe, who is the Under Secretary and a key contributor to the principles and new ideas that will underpin the Resource Management Act that is being redeveloped. But I am also here to share with you, we will not be deterred in the creation of a fast-track piece of legislation so mining, roading, infrastructure and other big developments that keep Kiwis and their kids in New Zealand can take place without being hijacked, diverted, distracted by a group that are woke, riddled, climate believers and who don't accept that unless we can pay our way to have a good I know we have to adapt. You have adapted in your lives. I've had to adapt along with my wife, my beautiful wife Dot here today. We understand that. But this notion that we have to close down historic legacy industries in a journey towards the clean green dream is not only wrong, it will drive families out of New Zealand, it will depopulate the coast we need to use the endowments that we've been given. We need to profit from them and stop the catastrophization that every time you put a shovel, a machine, a digger in the ground, you're destroying the sacredness of Earth Mother. What is the point of being poor in paradise? You'll still be poor. <laughs> You know, this is a speech about certainty, this is a speech about commitment, this is a speech about confidence. Because unless you and I are confident that this industry has a future, why would you encourage your mokopunas, your children, to continue to live in the coast? I come from Kaitaia. In fact, I have a friend in Perth who recently started an airline company and he's moving people from the east coast of Australia to the west coast of Australia to mine. He can't find enough workers. I said, please don't send your aircraft to New Zealand and take my people away. And he said, where do you live? Kaitaia. And I said, oh, actually, I've got a few nests you can actually take away. <laughs> Look, I, I, I want to go through some key points and there'll be ample opportunity to ask questions. And I know that we're going through a transition trying to make the administrative system a lot more efficient. I've got two very senior officials with me here today, and during the course of the questions, one of them is gonna come up, so if there are technical matters, then they can be addressed, and if they are of a 
more uh, confidential administrative nature, you can chat to him on the side. When we say we have a rich history with minerals, obviously, I'm into Tai Potani, I'm into Waipono. So, through my Māori background, I understand the importance of Ponamu. But I'm here in this town, which was the origins of the Labour Party. I'm in this town that was built upon, sacrifice, was built upon investment, was built upon bloody hard work and the sweat of thy brow. We've got to go back to a situation where you hold politicians accountable like myself, to stand up against disinformation, that we can have the quality of life that I've taken for granted, you've taken for granted, without us having to make trade-offs. There are trade-offs, folks. Less than 1% of our dock estate is actually mined. The mining companies that I had lunch with today, sorry, if you have lunch with me or you have dinner with me on the West Coast, I'll make you famous for the wrong reasons. <laughs> We have this system where it's important that we list everything in the diary. So can all of you give your name afterwards? <laughs> Rest assured, I won't sign you up on a membership book yet. Thank you for turning out. Let me turn to my speech. What is the contribution of your sector, of our sector? Okay, our GDP, it's 400 billion. But over the last three years, whether you like to hear it from me or not, our, our economic circumstances have declined. And I don't want to go blaming other politicians. I want to just give you the facts. The amount that we export, the bit that we import, it has declined, declined. Of equal concern, we owe, as a government, as a society, over $227 billion. How are we going to deal with that with this generation, your children's generation, your grandchildren's generation, unless we turn and use wisely our natural resources. If you doubt that, if you doubt that, folks, the reality is that our private debt, your debt and mine as householders, as farmers, as miners, that's expanded as well. And what that tells me is that we have got to get focused on enhancing our economic welfare by taking hard choices, but wise choices, so that we can boost our economic solvency and our resilience. And as far as I'm concerned, the portfolio that I hold, both oil and gas and minerals, is a key contributor to that. But it won't contribute unless we get rid of the obstacles and the red tape. But most importantly, get rid of the uncertainty. Get rid of the religion that condemns us if we belong either to the minerals industry or the oil and gas industry. If I want to apologise for my sins, I go to church. I've been going to church quite a bit recently. <laughs> but the point I'm making, work with me, work with our government and make our decisions on the basis of science, technology and economics. Not semi-religiosity, which is really bending our trajectory forward in the wrong direction. I want to talk about where I've been this morning. Ikamatua. You will know that's the site of the Snowy River Mine. You will know that that's the location where when I was your provincial growth minister, we took a risk and allocated a sum of money of 15 million, long since paid back. You will also know that it represents a site for up to 200 jobs. Now, I can hear the voices saying, please, Shane, as you talk up mining on the coast, please accentuate and emphasise health and safety. I give you my word to the extent that those developments are influenced by my narrative. There must be no compromise, and I understand there are members from the Pike River broader family community here must be no compromise on safety and men and women coming home at night. But your own leaders, civic, business, commercial, have asked me to stand up and help rehabilitate this particular industry. So what does it really look like mining in New Zealand? 
Does it look like the apocryphal pictures that are served up on the internet in the Congo, in Brazil, other far-flung nations? No, there is rehabilitation, there is mitigation. But how often do you see that reported accurately in our media? How often do you see it discussed accurately at universities? How often do you see it being treated accurately by us as politicians? Very rarely. So I'm here today to stand up for the mitigation, to stand up for the rehabilitation, and to stand up for the social license that mining has created, has the ability to sustain, and for those of you who derive your livelihood from that industry, if you want it to be expanded, then please join with me and turn back the tide of falsehood and disinformation. Because if we don't, it's going to cripple this proud industry as it's threatening to do with my other beloved industry, the fisheries. So what are the barriers that have impeded us? I've, I've talked about the uncertainty driven by politics. I've talked about the red tape. I've shared with you what our response is to the red tape in the short term, which is the fast track legislation. I know, you know, we see propagated through the media the most apocryphal, catastrophizing accounts of what we're doing. All we're trying to do is to enable investors and communities to develop the infrastructure, develop the industries of New Zealand without suffering seven, eight, nine, ten years delay. And I'll put my credentials up against any of my critics as to whether or not that's in the interests of our nation. And just because we're going to interact with the environment, interact with Mother Nature, that should not turn into an immediate denunciation of us developing ourselves and developing our resources. We have been cancelled. There is far too much censorship. We are entitled to have views that accentuate development before debates that drive us to believe that every species of rare critter is about to die. Now, I know you saw me on TV. Well, maybe you don't watch TV anymore. I did get a bit loose with my language, which is somewhat uncharacteristic. <laughs> I did say, if a development is impeded by a blind frog, bye-bye, Freddy. I didn't mean that we're going to kill every species. I just said occasionally Freddie will be in the departure lounge. <laughs> so you've been looking, I'm told, since the government was formed for a clear message that the dock estate is available for mining. The Prime Minister said strategically and working sensitively within the surroundings of the dock estate there will be sites appropriate for mining. That does exclude what you call Schedule 4, but there is an enormous amount of territory, area in the dock estate, where we can and will access minerals. And what we're going to do is the Minister of Conservation and I are going to tidy up the access arrangements so that it's one thing to get your mining permits and entitlements from ENBI, it's another thing to get access in terms of enjoying the, uh, the right to occupy the dock estate. I know it's been very problematic down here, but it is a priority for us. And I'm going to tell you the other thing that the officials are going to work on. If indeed your enthusiasm and our willingness to expand this sector grows, then it is my view, and I'm going to take options to my cabinet colleagues, as the royalty income grows, some of that a substantial part of it should be redirected back to the West Coast to be used to fix up your own infrastructure. You know, I'm often challenged that this type of narrative threatens our clean green image, threatens to make us more vulnerable. Or well, what's most frustrating for me it's going to imperil our ability to trade. No single trade agreement prevents New Zealand from relying upon coal, gold, vanadium, titanium, any other rare mineral that we have here. The notion that we've signed up to trade agreements to make ourselves poorer is driven by a tiny group of my opponents 
who do not like mining, who do not like development and have not answered the question, how will the regions of New Zealand remain solvent unless we use our natural resources, expand them, create jobs and earn export revenue? The Prime Minister has challenged us as ministers to boost revenue from an export source over the next 10 years. This notion, please resist it, put it back where it belongs. No government has ever signed a trade agreement preventing us as Kiwis from profiting from our own resources. And the people I often hear in Parliament from the Green Politburo that we are breaking trade agreements. No, 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 no. Go to the EU. Go to Australia. Go to other parts of the world. You will see they are making pragmatic trade-off decisions to maintain their own solvency. That is something that it's high time you expected of us as politicians to do on a regular basis. Often it's said, we need to boost the transition towards a more climate friendly existence. I say, if you want to boost that transition, we have to mine. I say, why is it morally superior for us as New Zealanders to rely on critical minerals, rare earth minerals from the Congo, who have worse environmental standards, who have worse standards in terms of uh, health and safety, who have worse standards in terms of what you and I take as governance culture, but will silently bring all those minerals into our country but won't mine them ourselves. That's hypocrisy. I say to you, if we want to be resilient, and this mining strategy is about boosting our own resilience, don't rely on other geopolitical centres where these, where these uh, minerals may be located. Let's start digging them, finding them, developing them in their own country, and there's no place better than West Coast. And you heard that today, right here in Blackpool. You know, one of the most difficult features that you and I are going to face is that this narrative about opening up this industry, it never closed, but the minds of the people working in the industry, leading the industry, begun to close. Why? Because they felt that nowhere in New Zealand was there a place where they could speak with pride about an industry that is a net positive contributor. <coughs> this is the day that this strategy is unveiled. It's available in booklet form and it does several things. Number one, it affirms that there will be a renewed focus from our government with a more permissive approach to develop the natural resources of New Zealand to keep Kiwis back in our own country to boost our resilience, clarifying access to the DOC estate. Number two, making sure that the system is a lot more efficient to give mineral permits out. And number three, that if you require various permits, there will be a straight arrow of a pathway called the fast track legislation. It will bring all of the permits together so they are dealt with in one foul swoop. We won't have a situation where applicants are played off between one government department or another government department or fall afoul of the various grandees who populate the environmental committees and a host of other agencies. And at the top of the pyramid of the fast track legislation, folks, is an unfettered focus and emphasis on development. Now, please believe me when I say that need not mean the compromising of our environment, but I say to you, for those people who want to remain poor, but believe it's better to live in paradise, come to where I belong, in Kaitaia. We do not want poverty in regional New Zealand. There has to be trade-offs. These trade-offs can be made on the basis of economics, on the basis of science, on the basis of technology, and we should not 
acquiesce or tolerate any more of these falsehoods that we've got to close down the economy to learn to live with the climate. We must adapt, but we should never compromise our solvency, destroy our income, undermine our regional resilience to, to, in order to meet some international competition where our major trading partners are doing far less than we're doing. I want to finish up because I really want to um, take some questions and I have the officials with me by saying the following. Oil and gas is in an equally perilous situation. Increasingly, we're going to rely on coal to keep the lights on. Now, I know for some New Zealanders that sounds offensive, but it's the truth. Where's that coal coming from? Oh, it's coming from Indonesia. Not only is that odd, it reflects the fact that we are going to have to power ourselves with natural gas and coal for quite some time to come. That doesn't mean we should not have more hydro. I'd love to see more hydro. In fact, I know of a hydro scheme in Taipotany, which start, should start ASAP. We should have more geothermal, wind and solar, yes. But do not lose sight of the fact, unless we have unfettered access to reliable levels of coal, reliable levels of gas, the industries that you and the people of Taranaki work in and depend upon the lights are going to go out. And under the watch of my leader, Winston Peters, and the government, and the Prime Minister, we don't want the lights to go out because once you have your lights punched out, you're knocked out. And this is not a government that wants to be knocked out. Thank you very much.